Amen. It, it, is, uh, it is good to be saved. It is good to be inside, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, man, that's as cold as my sermons out there, brother. Um, we are glad to be here. I don't know why. It's got to be you guys because it sure isn't the weather. My wife, we got in Friday. We actually drove into or flew into, flew into Cincinnati, picked up a car and a load of books and came up here and, and um, got a lot of running around while we're here. We got three meetings, but uh, she said it's 40 degrees in Boise. I said, no, no, why was it we came here? I can't. Guys, all I can say is this. Please give us a lot of money to make this worth it. Okay, because I don't mean this bad, but you're not. But if you make it a lot, no. Um, I want you to open your Bibles to um, Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. I'm not uh, teaching out of that. I just want to see if it's in your version. Romans chapter 15. <clears throat> this is the Apostle Paul talking writing, uh, and he says this, verse 4, uh, for whatsoever things were written aforetime uh, and were written for our learning. Now, guys, I don't think he's talking about, uh, you know, McGuffey's Reader or anything else. Don't you reckon when he says the things were written aforetime, he's talking about the book? And he's not talking about just the New Testament. Uh, I'm amazed. Now, you know, I'm in Bible-believing churches, and uh, I'm amazed that you get in some places, and they think like, well, we don't bother with the Old Testament. That's not for us. Wasn't it written for your learning? It is all written for our learning. Uh, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, uh, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Uh, there are a number of, of theories on how to teach the Bible. I'll talk to you this morning about how to, oops, how to teach the Bible. And um, uh, you got some folks you know. Now, I'm a, I'm a Yankee. I'm from Ohio. You know what that means, don't you? <laughs> we won. Every now and then I go down to the south and I say, well, he told me you need to represent him from the winning side. Uh, you, can, you can ask your pastor, we're both from Ohio, but we're both Civil War veterans because we went to, we went to Bible college in the south, and I guarantee you we fought it. But, um, but anyway, you know, now, I always say this about the south. I love southerners. I really do. I, I think they can fly their flag. It doesn't bother me at all. Uh, and they're good people. <coughs> but sometimes uh, a southerner, when he, when he gets up to preach, it's kind of like throwing a flat stone at a lake. The Bible is the lake, and, and the stone goes, doing, never to return again. He hits one verse and, and never comes back. Uh, and then you got guys that give verse after verse after verse after verse after verse. And the fact is this, in fact, um, uh, and then some guys have to have every letter, every point start with the same letter. And that doesn't do much for me, okay? Now, I do it. Uh, I teach um, uh, preparation delivery. And I tell my guys, I said, you will have a style. But I said, get a sermon, get some messages outside your style, because you'll miss something if you don't. And uh, I, so I get messages that are outside my style, and they're as dead as my style. But, um, but I talked to you this morning about, uh, about how to teach the Bible. Um, there are, believe it or not, you, know, you say, well, I think it's all, all exposition. Uh, I think it ought to be prophetic. I think it ought to be this. I think it ought to be that. Well, here's what I think. I think we ought to consult our final authority in all matters of faith and practice, including the practice of teaching the Bible. And the fact is, guys, that there are seven different ways that you can teach the Bible. And I don't mean right, wrong, and then your way. Um, I'm talking about seven approaches to Scripture. Uh, I want you to go to Ezekiel chapter 20. And when you teach, when you teach the Scripture... Uh, here's Ezekiel. He's bringing bad news to somebody. Uh, uh, that, that thus saith the Lord kind of bad news. When it's thus saith the Lord bad news, guys, it's bad news, isn't it? And so it says this in verse uh, 46. I guess it's bad news for the southerners. Uh, Son of man, set thy face toward the south. Uh, and drop thy word toward the south. And prophesy against the forest of the south field. Uh, and say to the forest of the south... Hear the word of the Lord, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will kindle a fire in thee, uh, and, shall, uh, and it shall devour uh, every green tree in, in thee, and every uh, dry tree. Uh, the, flaming, uh, the, the flaming flame shall not be quenched, and all faces uh, from the south to the north shall be burned therein, and all flesh shall see that I, the Lord, have kindled it. It shall not be quenched. Now, let me ask you a question. Does that sound bad? I mean, somebody said, you know, if they just took South out and put in Ohio, that would get your attention, right? 
And you, you would not think that things are going to, you, yeah, they're gonna, it's going to be a winter warm-up. <laughs> so look what his congregation said after he said that. Look at the last verse. Then said I, Ah, Lord, they say of me, doth he not speak parables? <laughs> Guys, no, he wasn't speaking a parable. He was speaking literally, was he not? Let me tell you guys, you know what you need to do every time you can? You take the Bible literally. Uh, we have got too many preachers. It's enough, it's enough that lost people out there. But there are too many preachers, not in our crowd, that approach the Bible like it's symbolic, uh, you know, like it, it's just all parables. Uh, I was talking to a Jehovah Witness one time. You know, they don't believe that there is a hell. And uh, I, I said, I showed the course, took him to Luke 16, and, uh, and he said, well, that's a parable. Now, think about this. The, the rich man died uh, and was carried by the angels, or, or no, Lazarus died and was carried by the angels in Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died, and in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and saith unto him, uh, uh, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And he said, that's a parable. I said, I said, you think when people die, they aren't even aware of anything, correct? You know what they say? I said, how do you get that as a parable to hell? I said, I said your parable to hell is put a hot dog in a shoebox and bury it. <laughs> That's the parable to their hell, but it's literal, people. Look, I don't like the idea that there is a hell, but there is a hell. And I got news for you. Uh, people go to hell, and then after the, the, the white throne judgment, then they go to the lake of fire, and they spend eternity there. None of that is nice, but it is literal. If you're not going to teach it literally, you are going to do harm to the people you teach to. So you should always approach your Bible as literal as you can. <clears throat> Take it for what it says. Uh, I was talking to a guy one time. They had me witness this guy. He was a physicist, you know, and... and and you know, uh, isn't it funny how liberals are tolerant to everybody but us? And, uh, and you know, they'll, they'll never, you'll never get an evolution to say this. Well, you believe in creation and I believe in evolution. Oh, well. It's kind of always, they'll always, when they, they never say, do you believe in creation? They'll go, you really believe in, you know, like you can see the venom dripping off their chin. Like, if you dare say yes, and, uh, and that's what this guy did, you know, I asked what he said, you know, what he believed. Hey, don't be impressed, don't be intimidated by scientists. Anybody that's going to supplant the Bible with a cloud of dust, you're in trouble. This guy, you know, well, there was a cloud of dust and it blew up, but it actually blew in because when the smoke cleared, there was the universe and blah, blah, blah. And, and I tell guys, I said, I am not an explosives expert, but if evolution is true, you ought to be able to take this pulpit out in a field somewhere, put a stick of dynamite in it, blow it up, and when the smoke clears, you've got a three-bedroom house. <laughs> and so as he's telling me what, what he believes, you know, 4.2 uh, 4 billion years ago, give or take uh, 4.1 billion years, um, you know, there was a cloud of dust, it blew up, and all this uh, stuff came out of it. Uh, and, and I am doing the best I can. To <laughs> you say, you weren't. Yeah, I did the best I could to snicker and goof off. You say, why? If you don't do that, they're going to think you take them serious. And then they're going to take themselves serious. And then that's really dangerous. And so, and so then he said, well, and then he said this. He said, because he knew what I wanted. And he said it just this way. He goes, you really believe that God just spoke the universe into existence in seven 24-hour days? Oh, forgive me, guys. But I thought if I dare say yes, he's going to think I am the dumbest thing on two feet. So I said no. Six. <laughs> I don't believe he created it in seven days. I believe he created it in six. 24 hours. Yep. 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 If he, if he, listen, if he created anything on the seventh day, it was iced tea. Because <laughs> he just sat back and looked at what he had just been doing first. Because that's what you guys do. Come on, guys. You fix something. And then you spend an hour. Give me, give me a glass of tea. Like, well, look at what I did here. <laughs> you say, well, that's a little crazy. Well, and, and a cloud of dust isn't crazy? I mean, evolution isn't crazy? You guys know, you, I'm not the first one to tell you. I'm sure your pastor said it. Other preachers have said it. You know why we believe in creation? Because we don't have enough faith to believe in evolution. So you take the Bible literally. You say, yes, you should never take the Bible allegorically. Be careful. Because sometimes you should. So, brother, you can't take the Bible allegorically. I don't know. Let's take a look. 
Uh, go with me, if you will, to Galatians chapter 4. So you can teach the Bible <clears throat> literally, and yet you can <coughs> teach it allegorically. Galatians chapter 4, uh, I'll pick it up about, mm, 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 about verse 22. Uh, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman and the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, um, but he of the free woman was, was by promise, which things are and, what's the word? Yeah. And you say, you mean that didn't happen? Absolutely it happened. Yes, absolutely, everything you read happened. And this is where you teach allegorically. You take something that did indeed happen, and you get an allegorical lesson from it. It's not that what, uh, there are, listen, Westcott and Horn, they did not believe there was ever a man that walked this earth named Moses that led the children of Israel out of Egypt. They did not believe that. There's a lot of people who don't believe that. They don't even believe that there was, they didn't even believe that there was a, a man named David who was the king that came to, to, to the throne of Israel after Saul. They don't believe. Uh, uh, Westcott said that uh, he thought poetry is wonderful. Uh, and so, you know, don't you just think that God said, if God can say the sun is rising uh, and the sun is setting, then couldn't Moses and David be poetry? No, 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 no. Okay? So those are literal, but you can take an allegorical lesson from that, can you not? So, he says this is an allegory. For these are the two co covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth the bondage, which is Agar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. For this Agar is Mount Sinai, not in Egypt in the Sinai Desert. I'm sorry, that's not what it says. It just says Arabia, doesn't it? Think about that. Uh, and answered to Jerusalem, which now is, uh, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. Guys, then you can, look at, you can look at Hagar and you can look at um, Sarah and you can see an allegory in life. There are people that are bound by the world. There are people that are, we are bound to Jerusalem, are we not? We are. Uh, I don't have any problem, uh, you know, having a Jewish book and a Jewish God and a Jewish Savior. It doesn't bother me at all. Uh, I am not trying to pick the Jews' pockets. You guys got verses? You got verses, promises that, that like comfort you or give you some promise for the future. You got those? You know, I got so many of them in this Bible that I don't feel like I got to pick the ones that were just given to Israel and push them out of the picture. I got enough for me. I got enough to last a lifetime. So you can teach the Bible literally, or you can teach it allegorically. Um, let me show you something. Look at John chapter six. And I'm going to show you where I was talking to a Roman Catholic. Uh, I'm trying to think if he's a priest or not. He seems like he was a priest. And you know, uh, John chapter 6, that is the famous bread of life discourse. Uh, that is where the first church split happened. After the bread of life discourse, we had the first split. This is where the Lord says, <coughs> verse 48, I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the bread of I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread. Is he talking about himself? He is, isn't he? Okay. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread uh, that, I will give, uh, that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews, therefore, strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, uh, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whosoever eateth my flesh is be, I mean, is he pressing a point? He didn't say this in passing. He has come back to it time and time again. He is standing in front of these people saying, you have got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Is that not what he's plainly saying? 54, whosoever uh, eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him uh, at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. That, is, that was so hard to take. Uh, here's, a, here's kind of a novel number. This is chapter 6. Look at verse 66. 666. 
From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. First church split in the Bible was 666. Now, I hear this Catholic priest and he says this. He said, you Baptists always say, take the Bible literally. Didn't I just talk to you about taking the Bible literally? And he says, then you get to John chapter 6 and you don't want to take it literally. You guys don't do what you practice. You don't practice what you preach. You won't take the Bible literally. Because you're not, you're not turning bread into the body of Jesus and booze into his blood and drinking it. You ever hear any, have anybody say this to you guys? You know, we preach the blood of Christ, do we not? I'm talking about the blood of Christ shed on the cross, not drunk every Sunday. And, and um, we preach that you've got you to be saved by the blood, correct? Have you ever heard anybody say this? Yeah, you got that butcher shop religion. Man, I said, wait a minute. We take his, we take his salvation once. We don't eat him every Sunday. We don't drink his blood every Sunday. That sounds to me like a butcher shop, not a church. But wait a minute, guys. What do you do with that? He said it time and again. Eat my flesh, drink my blood. Eat my flesh, drink my blood. Because my flesh is, is meat indeed. And my, my blood is drink indeed. And how do you get away with not taking the words coming out of the mouth of Jesus Christ literally? Well, what if, what if he told you not to take them literally? Now, first off, let me just give you a point of logic. Logic does not overrule scripture, but let me just give you a little bit of logic. Did he not say this over and over again? You got to come up and eat my flesh, drink my blood. Okay, I have a question. Did anybody run up and bite him? <laughs> well, think about that. I know you're laughing, but think about that. I mean, nobody ran up and, and bit him. Isn't that true? But look at verse 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. So you don't have to take it literally when the Lord Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, says, I'm not telling you you're really supposed to eat my body. Somebody could, they got stuck in a rut, didn't they? They couldn't get a, 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 a parable. They couldn't get it a spiritual lesson. They take it literally. They think they got to eat the, blood, the body of Jesus Christ every Sunday and drink his blood every Sunday. And, he, and after giving that very difficult discourse, he said, the flesh doesn't profit anything. You could run up and bite him. It's not going to do any good. You know what you need? It is the spirit. It is the spirit. It is the spirit. The words which I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Guys, you know how you got saved? You did not get saved by chewing on the body of Christ and drinking his blood. I know exactly how you got saved. You got saved through words. Oh, I mean, you know, some of you were in the military, some of you were in college, some of you were in a hospital, some of you were in a jail cell, some of you were like with your mother-in-law. <laughs> you know, those things that make you have things of thoughts of death and dying. And, um, but really, really, yeah, our testimonies would be, would be very different as far as where we were, how old we were, correct? But we all got saved because words. We all looked at words and the words were spirit and the words spoke to our spirit and we surrendered to the words. Is that not true? So, so you can teach it allegorically, but if, if the Lord says to teach it allegorically, it's okay. If you, take it, you don't take it literally, he said this is not literal. Um, Take a look at Acts chapter 13. You can teach the Bible literally. You can teach it allegorically. And you can teach it <clears throat> historically. <coughs> Verse 16. Then Paul stood up. Uh, beckoning with his hand and said, men of Israel uh, and ye that fear God, give audience. The God of this people of Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt and with an high arm brought them out of it. And about the time of 40 years suffered, suffered he their manners in the wilderness. Now I'm not going to keep on reading, but basically, you know what he does? He gives them a, his, a historic uh, kind of a resume uh, or, or a, you know, a, a compressed history of Israel. Our fathers were in, were in Egypt. Uh, God brought them out. He suffered them 40 years. Then he brought us into, into the promised land. You can teach the Bible historically. I got news for you guys. The Bible is historically accurate. Don't ever question. You know, you know um, let me ask you a question. I don't know if you went to college or not. 
But if you went to college, how many of you that went to college, at the end of a day, you know, you got like a nice evening, you're done with everything. You, and somebody said, what are you going to do? So I just thought I'd sit down and read one of my textbooks. That's like putting your finger down your throat. I mean, why would you want to read? Nobody goes home to say, I think I'll go home and read my college textbook. That's like saying, you know, I haven't had a root canal for a while. I think I'll just go get a root canal. This book is not just a doctrinal book. It is not just a, uh, it is not just a, a, a textbook. This book is a history book. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says um, about being corn in Egypt. And many times you'll notice that when it says corn in the Old Testament, it's in italics. And the reason it's italics is because that word corn was not in the Old Testament, in the manuscripts they had. It was just in the original. And... Um, uh, and and, and I, I read some guy and he said, well, the, the Bible's wrong where it says like ears of corn because there was no corn. Corn, like maize, you know, like you pop corn, like you buy sweet corn. It said there was no corn like that in Egypt. So when the Bible says ears of corn, it's talking about grains of wheat, not ears of corn. Man, I love to find out how wrong my Bible is. And then uh, I was reading a while back, and they were digging around someplace in Egypt. Guess what they found? Corn. No, no, they didn't find grains of wheat. They found ears of corn. You say, why? My history book said that. And somebody in, in this country or that country didn't believe it, but my history book was right. And so, yes, I do believe there was a Moses, and I do believe there was a David, and I do believe there was a Noah. And I do, I really personally, this is not scripture, I do believe that's probably it up on Mount Ararat. But it, it may not be. I don't care if it's an old closed McDonald's. There still was an ark, okay? And so you can teach the Bible historically. There are, there are just times when you, can, when you can look at the Bible and get a good history. It's good to look at your Bible historically. I'll give you something. We were in Israel a couple of, couple of years ago, a few years ago, <coughs> and, um, uh, and, and if anything changed, I, I did a study when I came back that I'd never done before because it never came to my mind because I'd made a mistake for over 40 years when I read my Bible. For over 40 years, every time I read the Gospels, when I saw the word Pharisee, like the Lord was talking to a Pharisee or the Pharisees showed up, I automatically placed that, what was going on, in Jerusalem. I just, for me, Pharisee and Jerusalem was synonymous. If it was a Pharisee, they're in Jerusalem. And when I got over there, I'm looking around, and, and I realized, and, and so I did, a, um, I did what I call a geographic study, uh, a geographic history of the Lord's life. And you ought to check it out. You know what you find out? You find out that most of his ministry, here you got, you've got Jerusalem down here, and you got uh, uh, the Sea of Galilee up here, uh, and Nazareth is right in here, and this is Tiberias, this area. We spent some time there. And most of his ministry was all spent around here. It was almost all. I don't mean this in any, any uh, defaming way. He was a small-time country preacher. And when a small-time country preacher goes to the big city, do you know what the big shots in the city say? Come down here, boy, we'll kill you. And they did. They did. But historically, read it yourself. When you read your Gospels, look at how many times. Just, just take a little piece of paper. Just take something about that big. And every time it says, and Jesus went to, then put, that's where he was. And you'll find out that he very, very seldom, in that three and a half years, he, he very infrequently went to Jerusalem. And you, so you can teach historically about the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ. So the Bible is a historical book. Uh, look at chapter 8, Acts chapter 8. In Acts chapter 8, <clears throat> this is the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. This Ethiopian eunuch was, uh, was a convert to Judaism. What is an Ethiopian running to Jerusalem to worship. He's been to Jerusalem to worship because now he's a Jew. And he's on his way back. And you know the story. He's reading Isaiah chapter 53. And the Lord says to Philip, go to that guy. He needs a little Bible study here. You're going to have to explain something to him. And so um, 
Let's see, we'll pick it up, uh, verse, chapter 8, Look at, pick it up about verse 32. Uh, the place of the scripture which he read was this. Uh, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shears, so opened he not his mouth. Uh, in his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? Uh, for his life was taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh this prophet? Uh, this of himself or of some other man? Let me stop for a second. Is, is Isaiah 53 not one of the clearest pictures of Jesus Christ and his payment for our sins in the Old Testament? And some of you may, you may say this. How can a Jew who reads his book of Isaiah that rejects Christ, how can he not see Jesus Christ there? That is a valid question. And the, the answer is that they don't see Jesus Christ. They see the nation of Israel. Everything that happens to, to uh, Jesus Christ in Isaiah 53, they see it happening to them. I mean, let's, let's face it. What one nation has been persecuted more than the nation of Israel? Uh, if you look at Isaiah 53, they have taken some beatings. They have been murdered in mass, have they not? And so they see Isaiah 53 as talking about themselves. That's where they start playing the violin. Yeah, we've had it so bad. That's how they are. So they don't see this. And the eunuch doesn't see it. So here's what Philip says. And I like the way this is phrased. Isn't it nice? It says, verse 35, Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. <laughs> Isn't that nice? And as they went on their way, they came to a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Now, guys, I am a teacher. I am a preacher. So I teach and I preach. You know what I don't do? I don't challenge. To me, you know, from when I got saved, before I got saved, a challenge was if somebody smacks you in the mouth. That was a challenge. But I'm going to give you a little challenge. And here's the little challenge. Don't do this now. Do it on your own. When you get home, read Isaiah 53. I challenge you to find baptism in it. I challenge you to find a glass of water in it. I challenge you to find a drop of water in it. So I'm thinking, wait a second, I'm looking at this, and, and Philip is telling him, he's teaching him Isaiah, Isaiah 53, and when he gets done, the guy says, oh, I need to get baptized. Now, the only way I can explain this, I don't know if the pastor was there when, when I was down there, when this guy was there, but we were down in Pensacola. We had a missionary come through. His name was Billy Cummins. Billy Cummins, he was twins in one body. He wasn't big. He wasn't a big guy at all, but he had the energy of two men. And he was this wiry little fella, and he comes to the pulpit, like, and, he, and he had that kind of a stare. Like if somebody walked into a store and looked at you like this, you'd think he's going for the gun next, okay? And, and, he, and he came to the pulpit, and, I, and I'd just been saved, you know? So this guy, and he came to the pulpit, he goes, he goes, my name is Billy Cummins, and I'm a missionary to the heathen in Mexico. <laughs> now somebody told me there's no R in heathen. <laughs> there is when I spell it. <laughs> and you know, every time I read this passage, I say, I say, I say Isaiah 53, I don't, find, I don't find a drop of water. There's no baptism in Isaiah 53. And, and Philip says, there is when I teach it. <laughs> but I know what really happened. Don't you figure what happened? He's coming from Jerusalem. What just happened in Jerusalem? Didn't like a mere at least 8,000 people just get saved? You reckon there was a little bit of talk? You reckon he went to the synagogue and people that he saw weren't there? And he said, where's that? Oh, pfft. They got saved. They trusted this Jesus guy, and then they got baptized. He, he understood it then. And so he says, what doth hinder me to be baptized? And then look at verse 37, if your Bible has it, and if it doesn't, throw it away. And Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and he went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. All right, you can teach the Bible doctrinally. I said that the Bible is not just a doctrinal college textbook, but it is a doctrine book, is it not? Can I give you a thought? Don't be afraid of what I'm about to say. Um, all right, the virgin birth. Why do we believe it ever happened? Where do we get the teaching? Bible. Uh, the blood atonement. Where do we get the teaching? Yeah. Uh, the the premillennial return of Jesus Christ. Where do we get the teaching? All right, if we really get our teaching, uh, getting baptized, 
after you get saved, by immersion. Did we get that teaching from the Bible? So <clears throat> here's the problem. Most of you did not discover those truths in the Bible. Most of you, just like me, when I got saved, I was 20 years old as a Roman Catholic, and when I got saved, they began to teach me these truths, okay? And, and if you go to Bible college, they give you about three verses, and now you're convinced. But you kind of believed it anyway, right? All right, let me ask you this. If what we got from the Bible is really from the Bible, I'm not telling you to not believe it, but wouldn't it be safe for us to take it and set it aside and then go to the Bible neutrally? Wouldn't we arrive back at what we believe? The only thing I'll add to that is, instead of having three verses, you have about 15. I'll give you an example. Some years ago, probably 20 now, uh, um, John MacArthur, and I'm not ripping on the guy, but John MacArthur wrote a book. I've read the quote. He, nobody misquoted him. And he said it wasn't the blood of Jesus Christ. It was the death of Jesus Christ, not his blood. All right, I believe it's his blood. You believe it's his blood? Well, then, if it was his blood, can't I safely take my belief that it was his blood and set it aside? And all I did, real simple, again, got my little piece of paper, and, and as I read my Bible about three times through, I wrote down, I had two columns, and every verse that mentioned the blood, I put at the top, I put blood and I put death. Because sometimes blood is synonymous with death, correct? Now, see, you don't want to hear that because, because it sounds like I'm backing up MacArthur, but I'm not. Because here's what I found out. Sometimes it says blood, it can't be anything but blood. And if it can't be anything but blood, then John MacArthur is wrong, and it is indeed the blood of Jesus Christ, not just his death. Do you understand? But here's the difference. Instead of having three verses that I got in Bible college about the blood of Christ, I come out with a dozen. So this, this is a doctrinal book. It is a history book, but it is a doctrinal book, and that is where we get our doctrine, is it not? So the things, this eternal security, this thing you believe. There's people who think that's crazy. Then throw it out. And you know what I keep coming back? I keep coming back to the fact that nothing can separate me from the love of God. I come back to the fact that, that he is going to say to the damned, I never knew you. But in John chapter 10, he says, he says, my sheep hear my voice and I what? I know them. If, if you're one of his sheep, then the Lord can never say to you, I never knew you. You know one of the saddest things when you deal with uh, people with marriage problems is they say, when we got married, I thought I knew them, but I didn't. Well, you think that's going to be the judgment? Well, I thought I knew you, but I didn't. You're going to hell. <laughs> Doesn't say he thinks he knows us. I don't think the Lord could be mistaken. He said, I know them. The Lord knows me. So he can never look me in the eye and say, I never knew you. Please tell, somebody tell Stephen Anderson that. But anyway, uh, he can never say, I never knew you. So you teach the Bible literally, allegorically, historically, doctrinally. <coughs> look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And... In case you did not know, there are mysteries in the Bible. You like mysteries. Some of you read books about mysteries. Some of you read mystery books that are natural mystery books. Some of you read books that are uh, fictional mystery books. I don't have any problem with that. I have a problem if you read about vampires. Okay? Then you have a problem. But people like mysteries. They like to understand, you know, the room, it looks like you're going uphill, but the ball rolls uphill, and all that stuff. People like mysteries. Well, we have a God that knows some things about mysteries, does he not? And look what it says in verse 7. Chapter 2, verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Guys, there are going to be mysteries. Now, you know what I figure? I figure there's enough about this Bible that if I read it and read it and read it and read it and read it, I finally start understanding it. I'm not trying to crack all the mysteries. I'm, I'm going to find out what that mystery is. Don't be so proud. I've got news for you. You know what our problem is? Our biggest problem, it's not because we're sinners. 
Uh, it is our makeup, especially Americans. We want a one-sentence answer to all questions. I mean, you could be on a, on a boat and it is sinking and there's sharks around it and people are firing missiles at you and there's a meteor headed your way and you go to your cell phone and tell somebody and I'm telling you if, you, if you call a Christian, they'll say, we'll just do this. That is it. I mean, you could be surrounded by, you know, going down in quicksand with snakes attacking you and, and somebody give you a one sentence answer. I want to strangle those wonderful people. That is just the simplest answer I can give them. Can I tell you something? You're walking, talking piece of dirt that even, even man admits we only use 10% of our brain. And I have got good news and bad news. If you ever get to the point to use 100%, that's the good news, you still won't understand him. This is a sinless being. This is God. This is the eternal God. And you think you're going to ex explain him with a sentence? So there's going to be some things that you're just never going to understand. Yeah, it, haven't you ever had anything in your life happen, just didn't make any sense? You know, I've, I've told the Lord, I said, I, I just don't understand why you did this. I know you're right. But I don't even, don't, I don't even know why you're right, because I still think my way's better. It's okay to disagree with God. Just when you get done disagreeing, finish it by saying this. But you're right, and I'm wrong. Just make sure you say that. As long as you say that, you're clear. Don't go, well, I disagree with you. Go ahead and say it, but just say, but you're right and I'm wrong. I, I have a great confidence in that. I love knowing that every time I disagree with God, I am always wrong. That is wonderful. Man, I got great confidence in my ability to be wrong. Some of you probably have the same. But, um, but there are some things that are unexplained. We're just teaching Matthew and getting to the, uh, uh, the Matthew chapter 10. The Lord sends the apostles out and says, preach the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Don't go to the Gentiles. Don't go to Samaritans. That's chapter 10. In chapter 12, he says, go to the Gentiles. Now, that's contradiction in the Bible. If in 10 he says, don't go to the Gentiles, and 12 he says, go to the Gentiles, that's either a contradiction or something happened in between. What comes between 10 and 12? 11. And 11 is where he presents himself to Israel as their Messiah, and they reject him as their Messiah. So he says, you know what I'll do? You've heard it. Did you hear, hear anybody say this? Oh, he's going to the dogs. That's what Jesus did. In 10, he said, go tell the Jews, not the Gentiles, not the Samaritans. Go tell the Jews that the, king, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Look sometime. Read Matthew chapter 10 and read Matthew chapter 24. They're the only two chapters in Matthew where it says, endure to the end to be saved. Because they're both tribulation passages. Because that message of the kingdom of heaven is going to be preached again, but not by 12 people, by 144,000 during the tribulation while you and I are up in heaven eating fried chicken. It's going to be heaven. There will be no peas. And so, chapter 10, he says, preach the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In 11, they reject him. In 12, he says, go to the Gentiles. What's going to happen to the kingdom of heaven? Chapter 13, it goes into a mystery form. It's a mystery. You look at the, the eight parables in chapter 13. They're called the parables of the kingdom of heaven, but they are not. There's eight parables. The first one and the last one do not say. Every, from two to, six, to seven, they say the kingdom of heaven is like. Not the first one, not the last one. The one about the seed, that's not, that's not a kingdom of heaven parable. That's about putting the word out. Don't worry about the ground. Don't worry about who's taking it. Don't worry about whether they're going to reject it or not. Just put the word out. Put the seed out. But then you have uh, uh, from the second parable to the seventh parable, the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of heaven is like. And you know what happens? Every time we try to equate that to the gospel and our time period, and you end up in a tribulation every time. But it's all about Israel and that, them getting that kingdom. And when you see it in that light, it opens up. So there are some, there are some mysteries. Uh, I'll show you one. Look at Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 3. This is one you can see. Ephesians chapter 3. Paul, <coughs> he writes this in verse 3. How that by revelation he, knew, he, uh, he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote afore in a few words. Whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Boy, he's dropping the hint, isn't he? I know a mystery, and I'm going to explain it to you. But that's okay. He's the Apostle Paul. He can do that. 
He's not trying to sell a book. Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and the prophets by the Spirit. Here's the mystery. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Guys, if salvation in the Old Testament was just like it is in the New, how come it, he's telling you it just happened? How come it's just, it's a mystery? Wherefore I am made a minister, verse 7, according to the gift of the grace of God, given unto me by the effectual working of his, pair, uh, of his power. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Then here is the mystery. You know, I, again, I, I come back to this. There's this, uh, there's this teaching of um, replacement theology where we replace Israel. We don't replace Israel. And I heard one of those guys, he's one of Stephen Anderson's followers, because Anderson's messed up on many things, and that's one of them. Uh, and, he, and, he, and this guy, he said, well, I don't call it replacement theology. I call it inclusive theology. Because the Jews get to be included with us by trusting Christ. And I thought, isn't that just like a Gentile? Is this not a Jewish book? Is our Savior not a Jewish book? carpenter. Um, did he not go to Israel? Guys, the mystery isn't that, oh, the lucky Jews get to join us. It is that the lucky dogs get to join them. And that's what, that's what the whole thing is. This, that's typical Gentile. Typical Gentile is, it's all about me. So I guarantee you, guys wearing a shirt and tie, I pull it off. He's probably got the t-shirt that says, it's all about me. Because that's what all Gentiles think. And so he thinks, well, see, it's inclusive because the Jews get to partake uh, just like us. Oh, no, 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 pal. Look, let me tell you something. We had no business with this book. We had no business with the Jews. And you know what opened the door? This book, this book, Ephesians. Read chapter 2. Start at verse 11. Read to the end of the chapter. Chapter uh, 2, verses 11 through 22. You know what it says you were? It said you were, you were strangers. You were foreigners. Uh, said there was a... Uh, a wall of partition. There was enmity. He said that we were, we were outside the covenants and promises of Israel. And w through Jesus Christ, we got in, bucko. Not they got in. We got in. So, behold, I show you a mystery. Uh, look at 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. One of the classic passages. We, we've all read this, preached it. Verse 13, but I'd not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain uh, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. This is just an allegory. <laughs> no, it's not. It's literal, isn't it? One of these days, the Lord's coming back, isn't it? Well, you know what? I got saved. I got saved in a church of 5,000 people. Man, they were so excited about the Lord coming back. I almost didn't go to Bible college. I almost didn't. I went to the guy who led me to Christ. And I said, I think the Lord wants me to go to Bible college, but I know he's going to come in the next three years. And I don't want him to find me in a, in a college classroom doing Greek participles. I had somebody ask me, Gip, you don't even know what a participle is. I know what a participle is. It's half a simple. <laughs> Some people don't give me any credit. But anyway, um, and you know what he told me? He said, if God wants you to Bible college, that better be where he finds you when he comes. What was that good advice? That was uh, 47 years ago. I told Doc Ruckman I was down there one time not long ago, you know, before, before he died. And uh, he doesn't, you know, go in my bedroom or anything. But um, <laughs> I, was, I was talking with him. I said, you know, Doc, I said, if, if God would have read your Re Revelation commentary, we'd have been out of here by now. <laughs> I mean, the Lord would be going, whoa, well, well, saddle him a horse, saddle him a horse. <laughs> but... Um, Guys, come on. Now, I will say this. I've had people say this. I, not long ago, they said, you know, I never thought we'd be here in 2018. Well, I'm sorry, guys. I did. I did think we'd be here in 2018. 
I thought we'd be 18 years in the millennium, but I thought we'd be here. I thought by now the tribulation would have happened, seven years, and then it would be over, and the millennium would start around 2000, and we'd be, don't you believe we'd be here? I'm sure you did. You just didn't think we'd be this side of the rapture. But <coughs> prophetically, we can teach the Bible prophetically. When you tell somebody uh, that there's going to be a shout, there's going to be a trumpet, that we're going to leave, I'm telling you, you are prophesying, are you not? Hey, I'm going to show you prophecy. Look at um, Revelation. Revelation chapter 20. I'm going to prophesy for you. I'm going to prophesy right now. Everybody, no one is exempt from what I'm saying. Every person on this earth, when they die, they're going to die a whosoever. So what do you mean? Revelation chapter 20, verse 12, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. Isn't that an amazing word for God to use? When that's the very word he used in Romans chapter 10 verse 13 for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Everybody in this earth is going to die a whosoever called upon the name of the Lord and went to heaven or a whosoever was not found written in the book of life. Everybody's going to die a whosoever. You may as well get in the right line of whosoever's. I, we're all going to die a whosoever. I just got in the Romans whosoever's. You don't want to die in the Revelation whosoever's. But that's true. That's not, a, that's not a parable. That's not an allegory. If we make any mistake when we talk about people saying you're going to die and go to hell forever, well, the fact is that they're actually going to go to hell until the judgment. Then hell and death are going to be put in the lake of fire. You're actually going to go to the lake of fire forever. But it's so elongated, just say they're going to hell. <laughs> but they're gone, and that's prophecy. Isn't that true? In fact, isn't it true that you know things that are going to happen on this earth that the United Nations doesn't even believe? Isn't it funny, they always, po they, they always draw pictures of us walking around with a sign that says uh, the, the, the world is going to end, the world is going to end tomorrow, the world is going to end tomorrow. Now it's global warming, <laughs> global warming, we had 10 inches of global warming out there. Anyway, um, that ain't us. I remember back in 1983, they said by the, by the, the AIDS is so bad that by the year 2000, everybody will have it. Please don't shake my hand. Uh, they said by the year 2000, life would end as we know it. Global warming would have taken over. Boy, isn't it fine? See, we, our sign would say this. The world is going to end in at least 1,007 years. The world is going to end in at least 1,007 years. Isn't that what you really believe? Because don't you really believe the Lord's going to come back, seven-year tribulation, then a thousand-year millennium, then it's going to end. So if you ever want to get a sign, get one that says the world's going to end in 1,007 years. The one that says it's going to end tomorrow, that's a liberal. He wants your house, he wants your car, and he wants your gun, and he wants you to be his slave. That's why he's got the sign, to try to scare you. We prophesy much more accurately than them. Lastly, go to Isaiah 50, uh, 23, 26, 26, somewhere there. Isaiah 26. You can teach the Bible literally, allegor allegorically, historically, doctrinally, unexplained mysteries, prophetically, and you can teach the Bible inspirationally. Now look what it says, Isaiah 20, 23, verse 3, 26, verse 3. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Anybody here ever just go to the Bible and grab a hold of an inspirational verse? You know, some of you, have, you're, you didn't go crazy because you had a verse that got you through the toughest time of your life. Isn't that true? Man, there's some things in here that are just, they are, they are precious and they're inspirational. Uh, look at Proverbs. Proverbs has so many. But look at Proverbs chapter 3. Verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart 
and lean not unto thine own understanding. Guys, I know that was written to Israel. You're going to tell me that's not good, good advice today? That is good advice today, isn't it? Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Aren't you glad there are some inspirational verses in this book? Man, I'll tell you guys, I appreciate the inspiration. Hey, you know, your church is Hope Baptist Church. Do you know what the difference between faith and hope is? Um, some years ago, uh, about 14, a pastor's son was put in prison um, unrighteously, improperly. He didn't belong there. Doesn't belong there. And, and if you were arrested, let's say you were arrested for something. You know, not long ago, uh, there, there was somebody... Uh, they, they brought a lawsuit against a bakery that wouldn't bake a cake for a couple of homosexuals. All right? And there, the people that have the, the bakery are Christians. And if that kind of persecution came down on you, you would do this. You would have faith that the Lord is going to get you through it. That's faith. That's faith. But look at Romans chapter 8. Look at Romans 8. Because right now, that young man who's been in prison for 14 years is looking to, 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 to be paroled. He's going to sit down before a parole board. And we, I've, been pray, I've been praying for this guy for every day for 14 years. Every day, every morning, I go to God. Get him out, get him out, get him out. Faith, I have faith God's going to get him out. But then when you hear he's going to stand up before a parole board, doesn't that all of a sudden focus your, your prayer, your faith to what? Uh, if you had the bakery and somebody is suing you, you say, well, I just trust that the Lord is going to get me through this. And then your lawyer says, well, tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock, I'm filing papers to have this dismissed. If they dismiss it, this thing's over. You're going to call all your friends who have all had faith that the Lord is going to take care of it. And you know what you're going to do? You're going to say, focus all that faith on, look, verse 24. Romans 8, 24, for you're saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what, is, for what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for, for what we see not, for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. So when, you, when it starts, you don't usually have hope, but you have faith. Then somewhere after the trouble starts, something happens and you go, oh, this is how, I know the Lord's going to resolve this. This must be how he's going to do it. And now you focus it on hope. The hope is that somebody said I did something and they're going to find out. You know, now, now they said uh, they're double-checking this, uh, the photographic records, and they're going to find out that wasn't me that was there. You understand? And so we all have faith that the Lord will deliver us, but then whenever something happens, something happens during that trial, and you go, I think that's how he's going to do it. And you focus all your prayers on your what? On your hope. Isn't it good to have this book? Isn't it good to have the author of this book? See, if the author of this book was not God, we would just have a book with some very good things to say. I mean, really, there'd be, if, if, if this was just written by a man, some of the inspirational things would be good. But the difference would be there's no God to meet those promises. So yeah, isn't it good to have this book? But isn't it good to have the God of this book? That's what makes everything different. That, that's what makes this book different than every book on the planet. Every other book on the planet, every author is either dead or on their way to a grave. But this one is still alive, and he's still keeping his promises 6,000 years. 6,000 years. That's pretty good, isn't it? We teach this Bible literally, allegorically, historically, doctrinally, unexplained mysteries, prophetically, and inspirationally. But you know what you need to do? You need to read it. You know, I'm always pushing people. I'm sure your pastor pushes it. Read the book, read the book. Guys, read the book, okay? Just read that book, and, and however you need it, you'll get it while you're in there. But it's not going to get in through osmosis if you lay it on your chest when you sleep. I've had guys tell me, oh, I open it up and lay it on my chest. I said, it's not printed backwards on your shirt, bucko. I said, it doesn't get in through osmosis. I said, you got to read it. And then it's something when God speaks to you, inspirationally, out of chronicles, I don't know. I never read Chronicles. Shame on you. Because the same God that wrote Romans 
wrote Chronicles. Why would you think some of his words are more inspired than the rest? I could take you to a guy. He got the worst news he could get. And, that, and his daily Bible reading was in Chronicles. And he said, I went home that night and I said, God, he said, God, I don't need to read Chronicles tonight. I need Psalms. But he said, but I got to read my, he was 10 pages. And he said, but I got to read my 10 pages anyway after Psalms. So I'll read my 10 pages and then I'll read Psalms. He said, he told me, he said, I never got to Psalms. He said, God spoke to me out of Chronicles like he never spoke to me in my life. You know what's wrong with some of you? God's never spoken to you out of Chronicles because you won't read it. Well, I'll read it. Yeah, but you just didn't need anything that was there, but trust me. Trust me. He can speak to you out of Chronicles. He'll keep you going out of Chronicles. That book, he can keep you going out of anything in there, but you have got to be in that book. Let's have a word of prayer and take a break. Father, we thank you now, God, for you, and we thank you for this book. And God, I think I speak for these people when I say we have no problem with you, and we have no problem with this book, because there's nothing wrong with you, and there's nothing wrong with this book. Basically, I am the biggest problem I have, and these people are probably the biggest problem that they each have. But you gave us this book, and you keep your word. You gave us this book to get us through this, this miserable life down here so that we could have joy and victory and faith and hope and, and just have some smiles and, and some peace along the way. So we thank you, God. Help us to be students of your book. In Jesus Christ's name I pray, amen.